Hello, my name is Jay Chauhan. I'm the mentor in the Angel Mentorship Group. And this video prepared here today on the 15th of July is for the purpose of uh, the transaction or purchase of assets and uh, what happens in this kind of a transaction and some of the issues that arise in such a, an event. So first of all, when you when you're a lawyer and you get an offer it, in an asset purchase, sometimes the offer will come to you from an agent. The agent normally negotiates with the with the buyer and the seller, and very often the parties don't want a lawyer to be involved. And the reason is the lawyers are too meticulous in pointing out what can go wrong, and it slows down the process of uh, completing the commercial transaction. So the agent very often will be in the picture but they will normally use a kind of real estate and brokers, uh, so the, uh, the society's uh, form. That form, in my view, is not adequate for the purpose of carrying out a proper transaction. So if you get that kind of a, 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 an agreement, you have to be careful to see and look for a clause in it that might indicate that the lawyer will be reviewing that particular transaction and after his approval, the transaction becomes firm. So, but keep in mind that uh, when you have an agreement which is signed by two parties, in the law of contract is a binding agreement. So it's very important that if you have that clause in a timely fashion, you make sure that the proper agreement is prepared and point out all the issues that you have to from your client's point of view. The bigger burden on in a transaction in the common law system is on the purchaser's lawyer because in the in the system it's the purchaser's lawyer who is going to certify the title and show to the client that he's done his so-called due diligence and then close the transaction in accordance with the terms of the agreement. But you may be cast in the role of negotiating in some situations because the purchase agreement requires the understanding very often of some of the clauses, I won't go through all of them, but the most important of them is what is called the representations. Now, what are representations? They are the various issues that arise in which the vendor makes a statement to the purchaser in the agreement that certain things are true and correct, namely that the title of the assets are free and clear, there are no judgments, there is no litigation, that if it is a vendor, is a company, that the company is properly incorporated and in an existing entity which is conveying the assets. And those kinds of representations uh, are very, very important because that's the role of the lawyer to perform in a purchase transaction. He has to make sure that these representations are not only made in the agreement, but also carried out in terms of the searches that you conduct. The most important one in my view is a financial statement. So in an asset purchase, if I can just do a sketch actually, that if you're buying the assets of this company, let's say, then you have assets which are owned by the company and there are only the tangible assets along with the lease that you're getting. But in that situation, the representations of financial statement are not technically relevant. But what happens very often is that the purchaser, your client, is looking to see that the business was running in a good condition and that's an area of potential negligence that you have to be very aware of. So what you have to do is that you make sure that you have an accountant that you recommend that the purchaser has and that the accountant is then reporting to the client that is looked at the financial statement and is observed them they may be audited or unaudited, but they appear to be reasonable and that the purchaser prior to closing has an opportunity to verify the revenue, the assets. And there is some methodology that you can employ. For example, it's a grocery store or a place with a certain amount of income per week. You can even ask sometimes that your client stand there and watch the revenue. And then you analyze the financial statement to understand that the financial statement is reasonably reflecting by general accounting principles the revenue and the profitability of the business venture. 
Now, the reason why it's important is because some business people who buy the business are not very, how shall I say, savvy as the vendor might have been or the financial state might not have been prepared uh, absolutely objectively and uh, therefore the easiest person to blame at the end of the transaction if something goes wrong after six months, one year, then it is the lawyer that can be blamed. So it's very, very important that you that you advise the client to have the statements and you ask the accountant of the client to take the responsibility for what is said in the financial statements. And then you, you get from the client when he has the meeting for the different issues with you to have him acknowledge that he has reviewed the statements and other issues such as the counting of the inventory, etc., and how to do them, which will be done on the date of closing. So having said that, that when you are assuming the assets only, it is the assets that are being uh, purchased in the language of Ontario, it's called chattels. If in the language of Quebec, they're movables, things that move, the things that can actually be carried around, which is different than fixtures and land. And there is a different set of laws that apply. Very often, if you're buying a business, there may be even fixtures. So if these fixtures that are attached to the land, screwed, bolted, and made a part of the property, then they become fixtures and they still may be transferred to the purchaser. In that situation, you have to be very careful that uh, you have set up the expectations in the client in the client's mind that is getting certain amount of machinery or uh, freezers in a, a hoist or something of that nature that's firmly fixed to the ground but still needs the consent and the understanding between the vendor and the purchaser that they are being transferred to the purchase. Now there's a third party involved should something go wrong and if your language and the reporting to the client is not correct. Namely, if something goes wrong, the landlord is going to say that this is a fixture and therefore the property of the landlord. So at the time of getting the consent of the landlord for the transfer of the business to the purchaser, you have to also get the consent of the landlord. At that time is a good time to make sure that the assets that are fixed to the ground are also uh, consented to as being a part of the property of the vendor which is being conveyed to the purchaser. So I think that lease is between the existing owner which may be a corporation or a person with the landlord. As you can imagine since the assets are simply chattels then you're not automatically getting the lease. If you're doing a share purchase the situation may be different. An asset purchase definitely you have to ask separately the landlord to provide you with a, a consent to a, a sublease or an assignment of the lease. The sublease works by the number of days left in the property to be transferred to the purchaser minus one day because you cannot give more than what you have in the lease. An assignment of the lease is completely the remaining portion of the lease that is being assigned to the purchaser. Most of the time, the landlords do not care. They usually have their own lawyer and they want you as the purchaser to remain responsible. And this is accomplished by usually a covenant in the arrangement that says that the liability of the vendor owner continues as a guarantor for the purchase and the new purchaser assumes the responsibility of payment of the rents. So there is a question of adjustments of the various amounts that you might have to do, which will include the adjustment on the lease arrangements because you may be closing the deal on the middle of the month, and the rent may be payable for the, at the end of the month. So you can imagine that if the vendor has prepaid the rent on the first of the month, you're getting the benefit of 15 days that's been paid by the vendor. So this statement of adjustments is a part of the arrangement that you'll have to exchange between the vendor and the purchaser. So once the agreement is signed by the two parties, that becomes an, an obligation, and that is when you commence the searches. You do not commence doing the searches because you do not know how the other party is going to accept the agreement, and uh, therefore you will have to make sure that uh, the searches are conducted. I just, I'll make it brief because the time is going, and uh, there's a whole list of the searches that you can conduct in a in, a, in the case of an asset purchase, but the key ones being the Personal Property Security Act, 
executions, the um, the um, bankruptcy, and a number of things that affect the title to the property. For example, the status of the vendor owner company, and you should obtain a, a certificate of good standing from the ministry to make sure the company does exist. Then you close the deal, you report to the client, follow through the undertaking. Undertaking may be very often in an asset purchase, payment to the various creditors of the vendor in the Bulk Sales Act, which applies in this transaction, requires you to make sure that all the liabilities are paid in full. And then after the closing, you have five days to register the affidavit of the creditors signed by the vendor, which ensures and to the purchaser that there are no liabilities. So undertaking very often actually the obligation of the vendor's lawyer to pay off all the debts. So hope that was helpful. And for any seminars on this kind of situation, please watch Angel Mentorship Group on the Facebook. Join it and make comments below. Thank you.